We're going to continue in the idea of religious authority. And uh, looking for religious authority is a good thing. As in, how do you know what God wants you to do? How do you know whether what you are doing is what God intends? And uh, we did talk last week about this in two different in two different lessons, I guess, um, looking at ways to establish authority and uh, going through some examples of uh, ways that you know how to worship acceptably as recorded in, in the Bible. So this is uh, additional thinking about getting authority. And uh, we used especially John 7, where Jesus said, if anyone's will is to do God's will, then he will know. That's John seven seventeen. He will know whether the teaching comes from private authority or from heavenly authority, basically. And um, that's true. We use that basically to say, let God prescribe. Make it your will to do what God wills. And you know what God wills through his word. He chose to express himself through his word. So what he says should be the thing that dictates. You know, we, we went with the word prescribe at that time, and I still like the word prescribe. Let God prescribe. In, it's written down beforehand what we should do, what it is that he wants us to do. It's already recorded. It's written. And uh, so the things that we are doing, we don't do so by going first, if you will, or, or acting first and then looking to see whether that, whether that will be okay um, in the Bible. Instead, we go back and read the Bible and let it prescribe what to do, and then we do that. Uh, my, it seems like uh, shades of meaning, and so I wanted to go and look at the account in Joshua of what happened in the incident of Achan um, after they took the wall, after they took Jericho, because it's a good way of showing what happens when we don't let God prescribe. So that's why we're doing this. All right. It works when God prescribes it. That's the first thing that you should know is if you want something to succeed, if you want it to go well, if you want it to, to, uh, to work out the way that God wants things to work out, then, well, the way to do that is to look for God's prescription. What he said to do is the thing to do. And when he said to do it this way, well, this is the way that works. It's guaranteed. Um, if you do God's things in God's ways, you get God's results. That may not be the result that you are looking for. It may not be the metric that you have set up for yourself, but you have to ask, why are you looking for that? And why is that your metric? Shouldn't the metric be, what did God say? And are we doing that? Um, and then, you know, however it works is how it works. It's, it's doing what God intended for it to do. But truthfully, um, what it is that he gives us to do can be done and can be done successfully. For example, in Joshua 6, when the Lord told the people to take Jericho, he told them to do so. It's recorded at verse 2 that he told the leader Joshua, See, I've given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. What it's telling us is that God prescribed the capture of Jericho. Yes, in a larger sense, they knew that they had come to the promised land and that the promised land was currently inhabited. And that was going to have to change somehow. <laughs> that was clear enough. But when they got there, what to do, when, how, right? This is what to do, when, how. They got there. Then the Lord said to them, I have given Jericho into your hand. It's done. He's already made the decision with its king and mighty men of valor. Just pointing out that there is a direct statement from God to Jericho or to Joshua. Excuse me. I'm going to keep doing that for the whole hour, I think. <laughs> um, direct command to Joshua or direct statement to Joshua. I have given Jericho into your hand and told them how to take it, which is what you read about in the 20th verse. The people shouted, the trumpets were blown, that's what God told them to do. 
And as soon as the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the people shouted a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the people went up directly into the city, every man straight before him, and captured the city. This is what God told them to do. Um, you know, we maybe would come up with siege works, rams, some kind of explosion maybe, if we're into anachronisms, but um, that's not what God said to do. What he prescribed to them was very different, but it is what worked, and it is what brought down the walls of Jericho, removed its defenses, and allowed them to capture the city as God had said that they would and should. It's also the case that Hebrews 11 uh, verse 30 captures that it was by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. It was by faith. So they had faith. You know, faith comes by hear hearing and hearing by the word of God. Acting on what God prescribes is faith. That's what it is to believe God, to trust God. When you follow through with what he prescribed. And there was no reason, if you will, in a vacuum, I guess, there's no reason to think that shouting and blowing trumpets is going to cause the walls of the world's most fortified city suddenly to collapse. <laughs> it's of the Lord. And I have heard feeble attempts to say that they struck the right frequency to cause the, the walls to vibrate, to, uh, you know, that's pretty funny. Um, you know, we've got oceanfront property in Arizona, if you've got some of that. Um, or as I heard one desert dweller say, we've got lots of beach. We just don't have an ocean. <laughs> Well, it's by faith, and that worked. It's also the case, if you skip forward a chapter to, uh, to the eighth chapter of Joshua, that in the first verse, there's something that looks very much like 6-2. It looks just like chapter 6, verse 2. The Lord said to Joshua, do not fear, do not be dismayed. Take all the fighting men with you. Arise, go up to Ai. But specifically, he said, see, I have given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land. That's just like um, that's just like Joshua 6.2 that we read. The Lord said, See, I've given Jericho into your hand with its king and mighty men of valor. That's Joshua 6.2. But again, Joshua 8.1, See, I've given into your hand the king of Ai and his people, his city and his land. So God also prescribed the capture of Ai, and that capture succeeded in Joshua 8.28. Joshua burned Ai, made it forever a heap of ruins, as it is to this day. So, again, the point of, of these things is that when God prescribes it, it works. And if he tells you to do the thing and you do the thing, that succeeds. That's authority. That's how you know what to do. But what you read about in the seventh chapter is that it also fails when you presume to know. Um, whatever it is that we try to do as the church or in religion, um, in worship to God or in purported worship or service to him, is going to fail if it's built on presumption, on our think-sos. It's, it's doomed to failure. And when I say presume, I mean going forward without a positive statement from God that this should be done. Um, the seventh chapter records in the second verse how they decided to go capture Ai. It's, it begins at verse 2. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, telling them, go up, spy out the land, which they did. And on their return in the third verse, they said, don't have all the people go, just two or three thousand to attack Ai. Don't make the whole people toil up there. Ai are few in number. And about three thousand men went up from there, or went up from among the people, and they fled before the soldiers or the men of Ai. So that failed in chapter seven. 
Even though AI was in the promised land, and even though AI was made of evildoers whom God had uh, already condemned to death, they fled. They were defeated. Why were they defeated? Well, because if you look back here, you know, at 6-2, he said, See, I've given Jericho into your hand. In 7-2, Joshua sent men and said, Spy it out. You see what's missing here? When did they ask God? When did God say to them, See, I've given Ai into your hand? It's not 7-2, right? It's 8-1. They hadn't asked God yet. He, God hadn't yet said, see, I've given into your hand the king of Ai. God hadn't said that yet when Joshua said, go spy out the land. And they came back with, eh, we don't need to send the whole fighting force. We can take them. But they couldn't because it wasn't about their fighting force. And why would they have concluded it was about their fighting force after encircling Jericho and blowing trumpets? What's that got to do with your army? <laughs> or walking across the Red Sea as on dry land. I mean, that's got nothing to do with your army. That's the power of God. So what does that mean for us? Well, it's just to say, we, we don't decide what we do and, we, and, and even when we do something and it does work, it's not because we're so great. <laughs> it's because God's way works. But you notice the problem here is that they didn't ask God. And God didn't say, I've given you AI. This is the actual problem. Everybody thinks the problem is Achan. I understand that. And that's why we're talking about it, because I want to dissuade you from this. The problem is they didn't ask God what to do. They presumed to take Ai when he had not said to do so. And that failed. Not because they weren't able. Well, they might have been and they might not have been. I don't know. But because it wasn't what God said to do. There was no religious authority. And whatever we do, no matter how equal to the task we may seem to be, is doomed to failure if it isn't prescribed by the Lord. I mean, that's the bottom line. And like I said, I want to dissuade you from the notion that it's all about Achan. Achan is a problem, no doubt. But why did Israel have trouble? Well, the sixth verse, or I'm sorry, the sixth chapter, when God told them to take Jericho, records in the 18th verse. It's Joshua 6, verse 18. Keep yourselves from things devoted to destruction, lest when you have devoted them, you take any of the devoted things and make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. So keeping the valuables from the houses of Jericho. What is that? Well, that's going to be household gods. That's what that is. The silver and the gold in the houses of the people, those are the idols. He's telling them those are devoted to destruction. They have to be melted. If you keep these, you make the camp of Israel a thing for destruction and bring trouble upon it. Bringing sin into the camp, that's what we talk about, right? But it's true. He had forbidden them from doing this thing, and this is the very thing that was done by Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of tribe of Judah. He took some of the devoted things, which means that the people broke faith in regard to the devoted things. Now, I'm going to go with Paul on this in 2 Corinthians. I say this to some degree not to be too harsh or not to be too severe. Um, it does affect the people when somebody has sin, um, even a private sin like what Achan has done here. But this is not a no-win situation. It also says in Joshua 7, 1, the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. And I think it might be better rendered as the anger of the Lord was burning against the people of Israel. 
And I say that because I, I would like to emphasize that because this thing um, had been done that was contrary to the commandment, he, God, remained in a state of anger with them until they dealt with that problem. And this is the important thing, that because there is this unresolved sin in the camp, he is angry. And when he is in that angry state, then nothing is going to work. This is why discipline is so important. And this is why, you know, following up on the souls of saints who are missing in action or who are not doing right, is so important. You have to deal with the faithfulness of the flock. If it is not being appropriately dealt with, then God remains angry and whatever we do will not succeed. But I say it's not a no-win situation because the fact is they could, they could have known that he was angry. Why didn't they know that he was angry? Because they didn't ask him. They just presumed to go and take Ai. They just assumed that they had God's approval because they had succeeded in Jericho. And while it's true that God is not, you know, capricious, God is not one to change his mind or to be variable, it's not true that we know everything all the time and that we're in this, that we're in some kind of a constant state. <laughs> We have to keep going back to God. Jesus said we give thanks for our daily bread. We have to go back to him every day. Okay. And I will make note as well about Achan. Yes, he certainly did sin. But he did not sin alone. This is the point we're trying to make. You know, to quote a different passage, shall one man sin and the Lord be angry with the whole nation? Well, no. <clears throat> Not necessarily. <laughs> Achan did sin, and as God had said in Joshua 6, by doing so, he turned the camp into something devoted to destruction. He brought trouble on the camp by doing this wrong. That is true. And it's true that individual sins among the people today can bring trouble on the church today. That is definitely the case. Um, so we don't, I don't mean to downplay what Aiken did or to, to uh, make him okay. That's not it. What I'm trying to say is for the purposes of authority and allowing God to prescribe things, what you got to see is the big picture. It's not that Aiken did wrong. The big picture is that the leaders did wrong because they didn't ask God first. They presumed to take Ai. That's the big picture. Achan is, you know, again, he did wrong, and there was something that they had to do to deal with Achan, and they, and they did it. But that's, you know, kind of, irrespective of whether they take AI or not. If they had asked God whether to take AI, he could have told them, you shall not go up because I am not with you because there is sin in the camp. He could have told them and they could have dealt with Achan before they tried to go and attack AI. If they had asked first, then God could have told them first, and they could have gone through the process of finding Achan and removing him. And yes, you know, when you look at the details of it, you can tell that Achan was not being truthful about what he had done. He was hiding it, and his family was in on the, get, on the trick as well. They were all of them down with the idea that they were going to have something whether that was they were going to start their own new religion out of these idols or whether it was that they were going to have a little nest egg of wealth or whatever, 
I don't know. It's true. The details show that this was a clear um, intentional wrongdoing by Aiken and his family. But that's not the point. The point is they hadn't dealt with it because they didn't know about it because they didn't bother to ask. They didn't let God prescribe what they should do. That's it. But God's angry with Joshua. Now look at what Joshua says. And, and it's, I've often in the past wondered why Joshua would say something like this uh, and how he could talk this way and, and wondered, you know, it's confusing if you think that this is about Achan, basically. If your thought is, well, that's not fair. We didn't know. It was a secret. And, you know, the whole class has to stay in at recess because little Johnny misbehaved. Yeah, but if you think that that's what happened here, then yeah, it's not fair. But that's not what happened here. What happened here was Joshua didn't ask God what to do. He just went. And people died. And yes, Achan played a role in that because he was the cause of the sin that was the reason that God was no longer with them. But God's mad at Joshua. And look at what Joshua says in Joshua 7, beginning at verse 6. He tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening after the defeated Ai. He did, and the elders of Israel too, and they put dust on their heads. They even put dust on their heads. What I'm saying is, look how earnest their plea is. They're very broken up about this. It's a real problem. They're sad that this happened. They expected to see something different. And Joshua said in verse 7, Alas, Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To give us into the hands of the Amorites? To destroy us? Would that we have been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. Wow, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? If you're a Bible student, you heard this from the previous generation. Only they said, why have you brought us into this wilderness to die and become a prey to jackals? Would that we had stayed in Egypt or would, would that we had died in Egypt, some would even come to say. And here, Joshua, why did you bring us over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites and destroy us? Well, you know that's not true. You're talking like one of the evildoers. Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? What can I say? Um, the implication of this is that God let them down. That's what he's saying. You know, what can I say? You know, I can't, you know, I, I didn't do anything to, to bring about the first victory. And, you know, it can't be my fault. Right? <laughs> but it is. It's not God's fault. God didn't let them down. God didn't prevent them from succeeding. The ninth verse, the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land, Joshua continues, will hear of it. Surround us, cut us off from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? So here he's appealing to Moses' way of arguing about this, that God says for his own name's sake, and that's true, he does. However, I want you to understand where, where we're, what we're getting at here. See how Joshua sounds like the complaints of the old generation. And what he's saying is, you know, he didn't do this. This wasn't his fault. God let them down. And, you know, everything is going to fail. He expected something different. And what I'm saying is this is what, I, what we call a conundrum. But this is the same conundrum for everybody who is not using what God prescribes. If you don't go with what did God prescribe for us to do, then you're going to end up like Joshua Things are going to go badly. There's going to be loss and destruction. And you're going to wonder why, because you thought what you were doing was what God wanted. What you thought what you were doing was right. And so you're stuck. You thought you were walking by faith. Everybody who is not letting God prescribe every step 
is going to end up in the same place that Joshua is in right here in Joshua 7. That's what we're getting at. That's why we say it's an authority lesson. You need to have what God says before you act. Or it's going to end up like this. So we continue in the 10th verse, Joshua, or the Lord told Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? He's angry. God's angry at Joshua because Joshua's wrong. <laughs> Israel has sinned, verse 11. They have transgressed my covenant that I've commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They've stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. The first thing that we know, you know, immediately, this isn't God's fault. The other thing that's happening, especially here at verse 11, all of these statements, in their short statements, and they're in quick succession. That's telling you that these are answers, these are oracular answers through the high priest, that they're using the urim, umim, and thumim, that they're using the, you know, rolling the bones <laughs> to get the binary answers, casting lots, maybe you would say, but they're getting the binary answers. These are binary answers. He said, get up, get off your face. And so the question is, has Israel sinned in some way? The answer is yes. Is it regarding our instructions for Jericho, yes. Did some? Did they take devoted things? Yes. Did they steal? Yes. Is it being covered up? Yes. Is it among them? Yes. Right. That's what's happening. They're going through the priests, and why? Why that's important is because Joshua is now talking to God. Now that he knows God is angry with him. <laughs> He's talking to God from a safe distance through the priest. <laughs> he needs somebody between him and God because God's angry with him. That's what it's telling you. The priest is appealing on behalf of the people through the umim thumim, umim thumim, I forget. You know, the dice, the lots, the, the bones, whatever it is. Uh, I think there's a lot of questions about what the material was. This is why the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they themselves have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Which is in direct um, contrast or direct contradistinction to Joshua 6.27. So the Lord was with Joshua and his fame spread through the land. But at 7.12, he said, I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. So they do have to destroy the devoted things. They do have to take care of this problem. But this whole conversation could have happened before thousands of men died, or hundred, dozens of men died, excuse me, at the hands of Ai. And it does correspond to the church. Um, and purity in the church is just as important to us as it was here in Joshua 7, 12. I'll be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. It's true that we also have to hold that line of purity for the churches that destroy the devoted things from among you is still a requirement for us. You have the example of 1 Corinthians 5 um, where somebody was in a sexual relationship with his stepmother. Um, and the Lord told them in the 13th verse, purge the evil person from among you, which is a quotation from elsewhere in the law, but is very similar to what God told Joshua. You're going to have to remove this before things can move forward in the local congregation. And that's true if there is sin among the members, if we have... Um, some evil, some bad choice in life. Somebody is living in fornication or is a drunkard or whatever 
There are many things listed in 1 Corinthians 5. Um, we have to take action on that, on that count. You have to try and restore that person. And if these efforts fail, then we have to withdraw from that person to purge the evil from among us. If we do not have this concern for the souls of those who are among us, then we cannot expect the blessings of God in whatever we try to do next. That's true. And uh, the prophet Hosea also refers back to this time that we were reading about with Achan. The, in the place where Achan was executed and buried, um, or rather I should say, the place where he was executed and buried was called the Valley of Achor. And that's the only biblical reference um, to a place called the Valley of Achor. Is that's where they um, executed Achan and uh, left him you know, buried there. In the prophet Hosea, centuries later, when God speaks of restoring the people to him, he makes reference to it. And it's the 14th and 15th verses of the second chapter of the prophet Hosea. Behold, I will allure, allure her, that is Israel, and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. Which is a reference to pulling the people out of Egypt into the wilderness. There I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. God sees a time of restoration, a time of forgiveness, a time that he brings the people back. The kind of care and provision that he provided when he took them out of Egypt by the hand and led them through the wilderness. But we note especially what he said, that he makes the Valley of Achor a door of hope. The congregation can have hope through discipline, is what it means. That when we are sure to hold to purity in the church, when we are sure to seek God's will first, a thus saith the Lord, you might say, the prescription of God first, then we have hope. That's the gateway or the door that leads to hope. That's when there can be success. That's when things can go well. But as long as the church is not concerned about the souls of its members, is not doing anything about people who fall away from the Lord, there is not hope. There is not success uh, in the spirit. But when he restores, he brings us, yes, maybe in the wilderness, but he speaks tenderly. He provides for us, and that discipline is a door of hope. And that's when things are new, as in the youth, as in we when we left Egypt, as in which, you know, spiritually today is when you first obeyed the gospel, when you came out of the world and became a Christian. Those are the days of your youth when you came out of the land of Egypt. So all things can be made new again through repentance and forgiveness that's available in the Lord. But that repentance has to be brought about by instruction, maybe even rebuke. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, lest you also be tempted, Galatians records for us. Uh, if the church is not a place where the souls of the people are cared for or, or are important, then why would we expect God to bless it? If he doesn't get a return on his investment, then why would we expect him to invest more in it? It doesn't make a lot of sense. And there are a lot of different teachings in scripture that would point you this way to understand. He's not going to keep working with a group who won't work with him. He won't keep sending souls that need help to a place that won't help souls. 
you can't expect for the congregation to grow numerically or spiritually if you're not concerned about the souls that are among us that are weak or that are falling away or have fallen away. That isn't going to work. The prescription of God, I think, is very clear in this matter, that we, we have to... Uh, we have to be concerned, you know, his prescription in the matter of Achan, you have to be concerned about the individual souls. You have to go back to God every day to find out what he wants. And when that is done, then he'll be with you. Then he will bless you. Then he will give you what the next thing is that needs to be done. And that will succeed. Well, we mentioned the authority of God earlier, um, talking about the need to let him tell us what to do, and he does. We have every indication that he wants us to be saved, that he wants us to be with him in heaven, that he wants to restore us to the kind of salvation that he gave Israel, taking them out of Egypt by the hand. This can be yours in Christ Jesus today. How do you get into Christ Jesus? Well, Acts 2.38 records, repent every one of you and be baptized into Christ Jesus or into, in his name for forgiveness of sins. Times of refreshing can become yours in Christ when you have obeyed him in baptism for forgiveness based on repentance in the heart. And you're a Christian at that point, a child of God, a, a new person in Christ Jesus. If today you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus, it is the day to do so. We have, we'll, have, we'll be glad to help you. There's water prepared that you might be baptized in his name. If today you are already a Christian but have not been doing what God wants you to do, well, you've got to repent, make things right, begin to do what God wants again. Dedicate yourself again. If we can pray for you, we'll be glad to do it. Nobody's above temptation. We are here to help each other on to heaven. And it is supposed to be a place that God would send people who need help. So we're trying to do exactly that. If today we can help you to obey the gospel of Jesus, or if we can help you to be restored to him, please let your spiritual need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.